Today we're going to talk a little bit about some recent tax legislation, some changes for 2012 and 2013. Um, Mark Well had an interesting question. He said, did they really have the nerve to promote a tax bill that's called the Taxpayer Relief Act? And yes, they did. So, not much relief in here, but maybe a little bit. Um, this legislation was passed in January to kind of combat the fiscal cliff and stave it off. We were set to have the Bush tax cuts expire. And we were also set for some pretty big spending cuts if this legislation hadn't passed. Uh, did a lot of kicking the can down the road, but there were some pretty substantial changes for this year. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about individuals, businesses, and estate planning as we go through the presentation today. Um, and you'll see, we'll start with individuals. And it's kind of a mixed bag here. Um, if you're not in the top 2% of earners, you're probably actually okay with this tax act. Uh, from that top 2%, not, not very relief-oriented for you. Um, what they did in this tax act was pretty much keep the 2012 tax rates the same as they have been in the past. So most of the changes that we're going to see are going to come in in 2013. Um, starting in 2013, for the wealthy individuals, which is kind of an interesting concept, um, the tax rates have gone up. And as you'll see, we go through this program today, they kept trying to tax the wealthy. And the problem is they don't seem to have a really good handle on who they believe wealthy is. Um, for this provision, they're talking about singles with $400,000 of income or joint filers with $450,000 of income. Um, those are going to see the resurrection of the old 39.6 tax per bracket. So we do have an increase on those. And you can see what the rates will be in, in pretty much okay till you get to that 35% bracket, and once you go over that limit, you're going to go up to 39.6. So we've got a 4.6% tax increase on high-income people. They also took a look at long-term capital gains, and, and when Bush was in office, he cut them to 15% maximum tax. Uh, there's a zero tax percent rate for people in the lowest tax brackets. That was scheduled to pop back up to the old 20% which it did, but again, only for high-income individuals, those making more than 400 single or 415 joint. Um, we're seeing a lot of interest in this provision in our office with people looking at gifting stock. I mean, if you're going to sell stock that you've got a big gain on, pay the tax on the gain, give the money to charity, um, a much better plan would be to donate the stock directly to charity, and then you don't have to pay tax on the gain, but you get the full deduction. We're seeing a lot of people also looking at gifting to their children or their heirs who may be in lower tax brackets if this rate's going to hit. Um, the capital gains rate is kind of dependent on the situation. If you have a short-term gain, it's at ordinary rates. Long-terms are higher rates. Um, and you can see there are some items such as depreciation, recapture, and collectibles that have different tax rates as well. They also took a look at the dividends. A few years ago, we were fortunate enough to see the tax rate on dividends drop to 15% maximum um, in order to <coughs> stimulate the economy and stimulate investment in our companies. That was scheduled to go back up to ordinary income tax rates. And what they've done is keep it pretty much the same as capital gains. So 15% for most taxpayers will be the maximum rate, 20% if you're over those high income limits. And what we're seeing a lot with this is people looking at restructuring their investments. Um, if, you, if you have a lot of investments that produce a lot of income, you may want to move those into retirement plans, have those tax deferred accounts, buy those types of things, and in your manage, in your outside brokerage funds, use tax managed funds, more growth <coughs> funds. I'm um, seeing a lot of resurgence in looking at municipal bonds, so if any of y'all need to float a bond, <laughs> shoot, this might be a good time to be looking at it. Um, retirement plans are going to get much more attractive as these rates go up and, and people want to sock more away into these tax deferred accounts. There was also some legislation, this isn't part of the bill that just was passed in January, this goes back to health care reform. And as you recall, when health care reform legislation came out, it had about 10 years of things that were going to change every year. And this year we're seeing a couple of additional taxes come in. So right now we're still in the, in the process of paying for health care reform um, and not really reaping as, as many of the benefits necessarily yet. But 
Um, so what we're seeing in 2013 is for people that are in higher income levels, that are for earned income, they'll have a 0.9% increase to their Medicare taxes. And you'll notice on this that they were back to that definition of wealthy. For this provision, it's 200,000 single and 250 for married joint. So we've got another little little different definition there. We're also going to see a new tax on net investment income. And so for people who are over that 200 or $250,000 level, they're going to have an additional 3.8% tax on their net investment income. That's things like interest, dividends, rents. Um, so all of those things are going to get hit with not only the higher regular income tax bracket, but an additional 3.8% net investment income tax. Um, a few notable exemptions, retirement plans are not subject to this tax, municipals are not subject to this tax. Um, if you have a business that you work in and you have, maybe you rent the building or you have some pass-through income, that will not be subject to this either. So you can see this, this really kind of stacks on top of things and if you look here um, on earned income, you could, for people in those higher brackets, they're looking at a 4.6% income tax increase plus this 0.9%. Medicare for five and a half percent, and and you can see the, the rates go up for short-term gains, non-qualified dividends, taxable interest, and then up to eight point eight percentage points on long-term capital gains, and qualified dividends because of the combination of that extra five percent capital gain tax and the three point eight percent net investment income tax. So again, I think this is going to spur a lot of interest in municipal bonds and tax-free investments, maybe life insurance and annuity products. <coughs> Excuse me, and also people looking really hard at retirement plans and trying to sock away more money into tax deferred accounts. <coughs> Another thing you probably noticed in your paycheck, this did not have to do with with this legislation, but it also hit was you can remember a couple of years ago they reduced the social security withholding by two percentage points to put a little more money in people's pockets and help stimulate the economy. That did expire. So as of January 1st, everybody kind of got a, a little 2% hit on their paychecks. There's also some new limitations that will come in. At, well, I say new. They're old limitations that have resurrected themselves. The zombie tax provisions or something. Um, and again, we've got yet another definition of wealthy. For this definition, it's $250,000 single or $300,000 for a married joint. If you're in those brackets, you're going to start losing the benefit of your itemized deductions and losing the benefit of your personal and dependency exemptions. And you can see they start to phase out. Um, you lose 3% of your itemized deductions um, as you go over that threshold. It starts phasing out and then you start losing the personal dependence exemption. One of the real parts of this bill that did provide relief was the alternative minimum tax. And that's we kind of have two tax systems. You calculate your regular tax, you calculate your alternative minimum tax without some deductions, and then you see whichever one's higher and you pay it. AMT was originally created to catch people that were using a lot of special tax breaks, oil depletion, things of that nature. Um, unfortunately, it has grown and sucked a lot of people into the net that should not have been there in the first place, but it's gotten to be such a big revenue raiser, they can't really do away with it. Um, but it, it was scheduled to get a whole lot worse this year, and thankfully they did patch it again. What they've done is the last few years patched and patched and patched, and this time they've made the patch permanent, so we don't have to wait. Um, so what we're looking at, you can see without the patch what the, the exemption from alternative minimum tax would be, and it, it went from, for a joint couple, for, it would have been 45000 now it's 80800 So a lot of relief there for people who might have been hit, gotten hit with alternative minimum tax. Uh, they did resurrect the state sales tax deduction. Not as big a benefit for most of us in Kentucky because you deduct either the sales tax or your income tax, which is whichever is higher. But it really does help the people in no-tax states or somebody that maybe purchases a new car or builds a house and pays a lot of sales tax during the year. <clears throat> there were a lot of breaks for children that were set to expire, and for, for the most case, they extended these and made them permanent, the $1,000 child credit, the um, adoption credits, 
and dependent care credits for child and dependent care. And there were a lot of education breaks that were scheduled to either be curtailed or expire. Uh, most of those they have extended, but if you'll notice, in a, in here, a lot of them are different dates. So the American Opportunity Credit, which is a really great credit for people who are paying tuition to college, was extended through 2017. Uh, the tuition and fees deduction was only extended through 2013. Um, and a lot of the other breaks were made permanent. <coughs> there was a break in charitable giving that was set to expire that now has been resurrected as well. You can take up to $100,000 from your IRA or retirement plan and donate it directly to charity and not pay income tax on that. So it can really help you if you're fighting um, things like the 7.5% floor on medical expenses or maybe your Social Security benefits being taxable, being able to take those distributions straight to charity and not increase your adjusted gross income. Finally, they, they increased the or they extended the energy-related tax breaks. Um, we saw a lot of interest in these a few years ago. Um, unfortunately, there are lifetime limits on these, so but the credits are much smaller than they used to be. And if you took them before, you probably won't get them again. But if you are putting energy-efficient improvements into your home, such as windows or doors or a new efficient furnace or a, a water heater, there may be some credits available for you. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Greg to cover some business for I'm going to start first following up a little bit on what Edna talked about to uh, go into the higher rates for individuals. And we have a lot of small businesses that the income from that business flows through to the individual <coughs> for a partnership or an S corporation. And so these rates will affect all of those businesses. So part of, of what you need to do if you're in that situation is take a look at some ways of restructuring what you're doing. If you're in a partnership, maybe look at an S corporation to mitigate the Medicare tax. If your business is trying to accumulate capital, they didn't change the corporate rates that are still the beginning brackets 15%. So if you're looking at accumulating capital, the best way to do it may be just being a regular corporation. So part of that change in rates affects businesses and, and how they impact with individuals as well. A lot of what was done in this tax act is the extension of some of the breaks to try to stimulate the economy. And one of the items was this bonus depreciation, and this is only on new equipment. And so where you have an asset, furniture and fixtures, equipment in the business, these capital expenditures, if the life is less than 20 years, you get an, a 50% bonus depreciation if it's a new asset in the year of purchase. So again, trying to stimulate businesses to make investments in equipment. There are some credits, rehabilitation credits, alternative energy vehicles, those are still there, so trying to spur investment. Section 179, this basically is the ability to expense the purchase of certain capital assets. Back to that equipment with a life of less than 20 years, whether it's new or used, you can expense that if you're under these threshold <laughs> limits in the year of purchase. Again, reducing your taxes, so, so basically using part of the, the tax code or using that tax benefit to help finance the purchase of equipment. And again, this is one that's on new or used equipment. You can't use this work. The bonus depreciation that I mentioned can help create a net operating loss that you can carry back and get taxes back in back years. The Section 179 won't do that. You basically just can reduce your income to zero. If you have leasehold improvement or certain real estate, uh, retail or restaurant equipment, basically uh, kind of, again, one of those targeted provisions that they came up with a law and said that if you're in this situation, something that normally may be a part of a building and depreciated over 39 years, they're going to let you depreciate it over 15 years. And again, another provision that's designed to try to spur some investment in these particular areas. 
on the research credit, and basically what this is, it, and it yeah, kind of an unusual provision that if, but if you're developing in your business a product or even a process, you can segregate those costs and get a research credit for them, and the credit obviously being better than the deduction because you're looking at a 100% offset of dollar for dollar on your taxes. So something anyway that if you're doing that as part of your business, we're taking a look at. Another part of the, the stimulus related to employment relates to work opportunity credits. And basically what they were doing is looking at a percentage of the wages that you pay to certain disadvantaged groups and giving you a credit for, uh, for those wages. This was extended through 2013, and it's a, a varying level of credits depending upon the, the disadvantaged individual that's being hired, but basically goes from a credit that starts out with one group, a maximum of $2,400, and if you're hiring a, a disabled veteran that's been unemployed for more than six months, can go to a total credit of $9,600. So, Depending upon the, the situation can be some pretty pretty significant credits for hiring a new employee. I want to talk about uh, finally the uh, estate tax provisions and this was Edna mentioned about the Bush tax cuts and expiring provisions and this one was patched for uh, for a period of time and at the end of 2012, what was scheduled to happen is that the exemption was scheduled to go from $5 million to $1 million. And the rate, if you're subject to tax, from 35% to 55%. So, again, a, a significant reduction and a significant number of estates would have been subject to, to tax in this case. And so what they did is that they extended and did this on a permanent basis, the $5 million exemption. They did raise the rate if you're subject to tax from 35% to 40%. So the rate did go up that 5%. The other thing that they, that they extended is what's called portability. And what had to occur in the past is that when you had a, a couple in... To, for the survivor to use the exemption of whichever spouse would die first, you had to go through uh, setting up some trust and some estate planning to do that. Now, fairly simple provision is this portability where the surviving spouse can use that $5 million exemption. <coughs> A couple of other things, and probably the most notable of which in here is just that where you have, say, a liquid asset, a family business, farm that causes your estate to be subject to estate tax, it gives you the ability to pay that in installments or to pay that tax over time. So a nice provision that's there in the event that you have an estate that's subject to tax and you don't have a lot of liquid assets in it. Like I mentioned before, as permanent as tax law gets in Washington, but at least these provisions are not scheduled to expire. So we should have a situation where we can do estate planning with clients and can do that in a uh, talking about a several year basis. And even though the, the dollars are lower, we still have a number of situations where even though somebody may not be subject to federal input, federal estate tax, they'll still want to, to ensure that whether they're providing a charity, if you have a beneficiary that you're concerned with, uh, concerned with a marriage, you're concerned with how they spend money, whether or not they can budget properly, a lot of that can be handled by leaving money in trust. So we still do a lot of, of estate planning in that regard. The other thing to keep in mind is, and we've had some of these already, is that even though an estate is well under the $5 million limit and doesn't pay a federal estate tax, you can still have a significant 
Kentucky inheritance tax. <clears throat> and we had one that was not anywhere near the $5 million state that had a, about a $200,000 Kentucky inheritance tax liability. So you can still have some significant dollars in inheritance tax. So the key thing to keep in mind is watch Kentucky as well. <clears throat> 